Chapter Nine of Xerxes, The Battle of Thermopylae, B.C. 480. The pass of Thermopylae was not a ravine among mountains, but a narrow space between mountains and the sea. The mountains landward were steep and inaccessible. The sea was shoal. The passage between them was narrow for many miles along the shore, being narrowest at the ingress and egress. In the middle the space was broader. The place was celebrated for certain warm springs which here issued from the rocks and which had been used in former times for baths. The position had been considered long before Xerxes' day a very important one in a military point of view, as it was upon the frontier between two Greek states that were frequently at war. One of these states, of course, was Thessaly, the other was Phocis, which lay south of Thessaly. The general boundary between these two states was mountainous and impassable for troops, so that each could invade the territories of the other only by passing round between the mountains and the shore at Thermopylae. The Phocaeans, in order to keep the Thessalians out, had in former times built a wall across the way and put up gates there, which they strongly fortified. In order still further to increase the difficulty of forcing a passage, they conducted the water of the warm springs over the ground without the wall in such a way as to make the surface continually wet and miry. The old wall had now fallen to ruins, but the miry ground remained. The place was solitary and desolate and overgrown with a confused and wild vegetation. On one side the view extended far and wide over the sea, with the highlands of Euboa in the distance, and on the other dark and inaccessible mountains rose, covered with forests, indented with mysterious and unexplored ravines, and frowning in a wild and gloomy majesty over the narrow pathway which crept along the shore below. The Greeks, when they retired from Thessaly, fell back upon Thermopylae and established themselves there. They had a force variously estimated from three to four thousand men. These were from the different states of Greece, some within and some without the Peloponnesus, a few hundred men only being furnished, in general, from each state or kingdom. Each of these bodies of troops had its own officers, though there was one general-in-chief who commanded the whole. This was Leonidas, the Spartan. He had brought with him three hundred Spartans, as the quota furnished by that city. These men he had specially selected himself, one by one, from among the troops of the city, as men on whom he could rely. It will be seen from the map that Thermopylae is at some distance from the Isthmus of Corinth, and that of the states which would be protected by making a stand at the pass, some were without the Isthmus and some within. These states, in sending each a few hundred men only to Thermopylae, did not consider that they were making their full contribution to the army, but only sending forward for the emergency those that could be dispatched at once, and they were all making arrangements to supply more troops as soon as they could be raised and equipped for the service. In the meantime, however, Xerxes and his immense hordes came on faster than they had expected, and the news at length came to Leonidas in the pass that the Persians, with one or two millions of men, were at hand, while he had only three or four thousand at Thermopylae to oppose them. The question arose, what was to be done? Those of the Greeks who came 
from the Peloponnesus were in favor of abandoning Thermopylae and falling back to the Isthmus. The Isthmus, they maintained, was as strong and as favorable a position as the place where they were, and by the time they had reached it they would have received great reinforcements, whereas with so small a force as they had then at command it was madness to attempt to resist the Persian millions. This plan, however, was strongly opposed by all those Greeks who represented countries without the Peloponnesus for by abandoning Thermopylae and falling back to the Isthmus, their states would be left wholly at the mercy of the enemy. After some consultation and debate, it was decided to remain at Thermopylae. The troops accordingly took up their positions in a deliberate and formal manner, and entrenching themselves as strongly as possible, began to await the onset of the enemy. Leonidas and his three hundred were foremost in the defile, so as to be the first exposed to the attack. The rest occupied various positions along the passage, except one corps, which was stationed on the mountains above, to guard the pass in that direction. This corps was from Phocis, which, being the state nearest to the scene of conflict, had furnished a larger number of soldiers than any other. Their division numbered a thousand men. These being stationed on the declivity of the mountain, left only two or three thousand in the defile below. From what has been said of the stern and savage character of the Spartans, one would scarcely expect in them any indications or displays of personal vanity. There was one particular, it seems, however, in regard to which they were vain, and that was in respect to their hair. They wore it very long. In fact, the length of the hair was, in their commonwealth, a mark of distinction between free men and slaves. All the agricultural and mechanical labors were performed, as has been already stated, by the slaves a body which constituted, in fact, the mass of the population, and the Spartan freemen, though very stern in their manners, and extremely simple and plain in their habits of life, were, it must be remembered, as proud and lofty in spirit as they were plain and poor. They constituted a military aristocracy, and a military aristocracy is always more proud and overbearing than any other. It must be understood, therefore, that these Spartan soldiers were entirely above the performance of any useful labors, and while they prized in character the savage ferocity of the tiger, they had a taste in person for something like his savage beauty, too. They were never, moreover, more particular and careful in respect to their personal appearance than when they were going into battle. The field of battle was their particular theater of display, not only of the substantial qualities of strength, fortitude, and valor, but also of such personal adornments as were consistent with the plainness and severity of their attire, and could be appreciated by a taste as rude and savage as theirs. They proceeded, therefore, when established at their post in the throat of the pass, to adorn themselves for the approaching battle. In the meantime, the armies of Xerxes were approaching. Xerxes himself, though he did not think it possible that the Greeks could have a sufficient force to offer him any effectual resistance, thought it probable that they would attempt to make a stand at the pass, and when he began to draw near to it, he sent forward a horseman to reconnoiter the ground. The horseman rode into the pass a little way until he came in sight of the enemy. He stopped upon an eminence to survey the scene, being all ready to turn in an instant, and fly at the top of his speed, in case he should be pursued. 
the Spartans looked upon him as he stood there, but seemed to consider his appearance as a circumstance of no moment, and then they went on with their avocations. The horsemen found, as he leisurely observed them, that there was an entrenchment thrown across the straits, and that the Spartans were in front of it. There were other forces behind, but these the horsemen could not see. The Spartans were engaged, some of them in athletic sports and gymnastic exercises, and the rest in nicely arranging their dress, which was red and showy in color, though simple and plain in form and in smoothing, adjusting, and curling their hair. In fact, they seemed to be, one and all, preparing for an entertainment. And yet these men were actually preparing themselves to be slaughtered, to be butchered, and one by one, by slow degrees, and in the most horrible and cruel manner. And they knew perfectly well that it was so. The adorning of themselves was for this express and particular end. The horseman, when he had attentively noticed all that was to be seen, rode slowly back to Xerxes and reported the result. The king was much amused at hearing such an account from his messenger. He sent for Demaratus, the Spartan refugee, with whom, the reader will recollect, he held a long conversation in respect to the Greeks at the close of the great review at Doriscus. When Demaratus came, Xerxes related to him what the messenger had reported. The Spartans in the pass, said he, present in their encampment the appearance of being out on a party of pleasure. What does it mean? You will admit now, I suppose, that they do not intend to resist us. Demaratus shook his head. Your Majesty does not know the Greeks, said he, and I am very much afraid that, if I state what I know respecting them, I shall offend you. These appearances which your messenger observed indicate to me that the men he saw were a body of Spartans, and that they supposed themselves on the eve of a desperate conflict. Those are the men practicing athletic feats and smoothing and adorning their hair that are the most to be feared of all the soldiers of Greece. If you can conquer them, you will have nothing beyond to fear. Xerxes thought this opinion of Demaratus extremely absurd. He was convinced that the party in the pass was some small detachment that could not possibly be thinking of serious resistance. They would, he was satisfied, now that they found that the Persians were at hand, immediately retire down the pass and leave the way clear. He advanced, therefore, up to the entrance of the pass, encamped there, and waited several days for the Greeks to clear the way. The Greeks remained quietly in their places, paying apparently no attention whatever to the impending and threatening presence of their formidable foes. At length Xerxes concluded that it was time for him to act. On the morning, therefore, of the fifth day, he called out a detachment of his troops, sufficient, as he thought, for the purpose, and sent them down the pass, with orders to seize all the Greeks that were there, and bring them alive to him. The detachment that he sent was a body of Medes, who were considered as the best troops in the army, excepting always the immortals, who, as has been before stated, were entirely superior to the rest. The Medes, however, Xerxes supposed, would find no difficulty in executing his orders. The detachment marched, accordingly, into the pass. In a few hours a spent and breathless messenger came from them, asking for reinforcements. The reinforcements were sent. Toward night, a remnant of the whole body came back, faint and exhausted, with a long and fruitless combat, and bringing many of their wounded and bleeding comrades with them. The rest they had left dead in the defile. 
xerxes was both astonished and enraged at these results he determined that this trifling should continue no longer he ordered the immortals themselves to be called out on the following morning and then placing himself at the head of them he advanced to the vicinity of the greek entrenchments here he ordered a seat or throne to be placed for him upon an eminence and taking his seat upon it prepared to witness the conflict the greeks in the meantime calmly arranged themselves on the line which they had undertaken to defend and awaited the charge upon the ground on every side were lying the mangled bodies of the persians slain the day before some exposed fully to view ghastly and horrid spectacles others trampled down and half buried in the mire the immortals advanced to the attack but they made no impression their superior numbers gave them no advantage on account of the narrowness of the defile the greeks stood each corps at its own assigned station on the line forming a mass so firm and immovable that the charge of the persians was arrested on encountering it as by a wall in fact as the spears of the greeks were longer than those of the persians and their muscular and athletic strength and skill were greater it was found that in the desperate conflict which raged hour after hour along the line the persians were continually falling while the greek ranks continued entire sometimes the greeks would retire for a space falling back with the utmost coolness regularity and order and then when the persians pressed on in pursuit supposing that they were gaining the victory the greeks would turn so soon as they found that the ardor of pursuit had thrown the enemy's lines somewhat into confusion and presenting the same firm and terrible front as before would press again upon the offensive and cut down their enemies with redoubled slaughter xerxes who witnessed all these things from among the group of officers around him upon the eminence was kept continually in a state of excitement and irritation three times he leaped from his throne with loud exclamations of vexation and rage all however was of no avail when night came the immortals were compelled to withdraw and leave the greeks in possession of their entrenchments things continued substantially in this state for one or two days longer when one morning a greek countryman appeared at the tent of xerxes and asked an audience of the king he had something he said of great importance to communicate to him the king ordered him to be admitted the greek said that his name was ephialtus and that he came to inform the king that there was a secret path leading along a wild and hidden chasm in the mountains by which he could guide a body of persians to the summit of the hills overhanging the pass at a point below the greek entrenchment this point being once attained it would be easy ephialtus said for the persian forces to descend into the pass below the greeks and thus to surround them and shut them in and that the conquest of them would then be easy the path was a secret one and known to very few he knew it however and was willing to conduct a detachment of troops through it on condition of receiving a suitable reward the king was greatly surprised and delighted at this intelligence he immediately acceded to ephialtes proposals and organized a strong force to be sent up the path that very night on the north of thermopylae there was a small stream which came down through a chasm in the mountains to the sea the path which ephialtes was to show commenced here and following the bed of this stream up the chasm it at length turned to the southward through a succession of wild and trackless ravines till it came out at last 
on the declivities of the mountains near the lower part of the pass at a place where it was possible to descend to the defile below this was the point which the thousand phocaeans had been ordered to take possession of and guard when the plan for the defense of the pass was first organized they were posted here not with the idea of repelling any attack from the mountains behind them for the existence of the path was wholly unknown to them but only that they might command the defile below and aid in preventing the persians from going through even if those who were in the defile were defeated or slain the persian detachment toiled all night up the steep and dangerous pathway among rocks chasms and precipices frightful by day and now made still more frightful by the gloom of the night they came out at last in the dawn of the morning into valleys and glens high up the declivity of the mountain and in the immediate vicinity of the phocaean encampment the persians were concealed as they advanced by the groves and thickets of stunted oaks which grew here but the morning air was so calm and still that the phocaean sentinels heard the noise made by their tramping upon the leaves as they came up the glen the phocaeans immediately gave the alarm both parties were completely surprised the persians had not expected to find a foe at this elevation and the greeks who had ascended there had supposed that all beyond and above them was an impassable and trackless desolation there was a short conflict the phocaeans were driven off their ground they retreated up the mountain and toward the southward the persians decided not to pursue them on the other hand they descended toward the defile and took up a position on the lower declivities of the mountain which enabled them to command the pass below here they paused and awaited xerxes orders the greeks in the defile perceived at once that they were now wholly at the mercy of their enemies they might yet retreat it is true for the persian detachment had not yet descended to intercept them but if they remained where they were they would in a few hours be hemmed in by their foes and even if they could resist for a little time the double onset which would then be made upon them their supplies would be cut off and there would be nothing before them but immediate starvation they held hurried councils to determine what to do there is some doubt as to what took place at these councils though the prevailing testimony is that leonidas recommended that they should retire that is that all except himself and the three hundred spartans should do so you said he addressing the other greeks are at liberty by your laws to consider in such cases as this the question of expediency and to withdraw from a position which you have taken or stand and maintain it according as you judge best but by our laws such a question in such a case is not to be entertained wherever we are posted there we stand come life or death to the end we have been sent here from sparta to defend the pass of thermopylae we have received no orders to withdraw here therefore we must remain and the persians if they go through the pass at all must go through it over our graves it is therefore your duty to retire our duty is here and we will remain and do it after all that may be said of the absurdity and folly of throwing away the lives of three hundred men in a case like this so utterly and hopelessly desperate there is still something in the noble generosity with which leonidas dismissed the other greeks and in the undaunted resolution with which he determined himself to maintain his ground which has always strongly excited the admiration of mankind it was undoubtedly carrying the point of honor 
to a wholly unjustifiable extreme and yet all the world for the twenty centuries which have intervened since these transactions occurred while they have unanimously disapproved in theory of the course which leonidas pursued have none the less unanimously admired and applauded it in dismissing the other greeks leonidas retained with him a body of thebans whom he suspected of a design of revolting to the enemy whether he considered his decision to keep them in the pass equivalent to a sentence of death and intended it as a punishment for their supposed treason or only that he wished to secure their continued fidelity by keeping them closely to their duty does not appear at all events he retained them and dismissed the other allies those dismissed retreated to the open country below the spartans and the thebans remained in the pass there were also it was said some other troops who not willing to leave the spartans alone in this danger chose to remain with them and share their fate the thebans remained very unwillingly the next morning xerxes prepared for his final effort he began by solemn religious services in the presence of his army at an early hour and then after breakfasting quietly as usual and waiting in fact until the business part of the day had arrived he gave orders to advance his troops found leonidas and his party not at their entrenchments as before but far in advance of them they had come out and forward into a more open part of the defile as if to court and anticipate their inevitable and dreaded fate here a most terrible combat ensued one which for a time seemed to have no other object than mutual destruction until at length leonidas himself fell and then the contest for the possession of his body superseded the unthinking and desperate struggles of mere hatred and rage four times the body having been taken by the persians was retaken by the greeks at last the latter retreated bearing the dead body with them past their entrenchment until they gained a small eminence in the rear of it at a point where the pass was wider here the few that were still left gathered together the detachment which ephialtus had guided were coming up from below the spartans were faint and exhausted with their desperate efforts and were bleeding from the wounds they had received their swords and spears were broken to pieces their leader and nearly all their company were slain but the savage and tiger-like ferocity which animated them continued unabated till the last they fought with tooth and nail when all other weapons failed them and bit the dust at last as they fell in convulsive and unyielding despair the struggle did not cease till they were all slain and every limb of every man ceased to quiver there were stories in circulation among mankind after this battle importing that one or two of the corps escaped the fate of the rest there were two soldiers it was said that had been left in a town near the pass as invalids being afflicted with a severe inflammation of the eyes one of them when he heard that the spartans were to be left in the pass went in of his own accord and joined them choosing to share the fate of his comrades it was said that he ordered his servant to conduct him to the place the servant did so and then fled himself in great terror the sick soldier remained and fought with the rest the other of the invalids was saved but on his return to sparta he was considered as stained with indelible disgrace for what his countrymen regarded a base dereliction from duty in not sharing his comrades fate there was also a story of another man who had been sent away on some mission into thessaly and who did not return until all was over and also of two others who had been sent to sparta and were returning 
when they heard of the approaching conflict one of them hastened into the pass and was killed with his companions the other delayed and was saved whether any of these rumors were true it is not now certain there is however no doubt that with at most a few exceptions such as these the whole three hundred were slain the thebans early in the conflict went over in a body to the enemy xerxes came after the battle to view the ground it was covered with many thousands of dead bodies nearly all of whom of course were persians the wall of the entrenchment was broken down and the breaches in it choked up by the bodies the morasses made by the water of the springs were trampled into deep mire and were full of the mutilated forms of men and of broken weapons when xerxes came at last to the body of leonidas and was told that that was the man who had been the leader of the band he gloried over it in great exultation and triumph at length he ordered the body to be decapitated and the headless trunk to be nailed to a cross xerxes then commanded that a great hole should be dug and ordered all the bodies of the persians that had been killed to be buried in it except only about a thousand which he left upon the ground the object of this was to conceal the extent of the loss which his army had sustained the more perfectly to accomplish this end he caused the great grave when it was filled up to be strewed over with leaves so as to cover and conceal all indications of what had been done this having been carefully effected he sent the message to the fleet which was alluded to at the close of the last chapter inviting the officers to come and view the ground the operations of the fleet described in the last chapter and those of the army narrated in this took place it will be remembered at the same time and in the same vicinity too for by referring to the map it will appear that thermopylae was upon the coast exactly opposite to the channel or arm of the sea lying north of euboa where the naval contests had been waged so that while xerxes had been making his desperate efforts to get through the pass his fleet had been engaged in a similar conflict with the squadrons of the greeks directly opposite to him twenty or thirty miles in the offing after the battle of thermopylae was over xerxes sent for demaratus and inquired of him how many more soldiers there were in greece as leonidas and his three hundred spartans demaratus replied that he could not say how many precisely there were in greece but that there were eight thousand such in sparta alone xerxes then asked the opinion of damaratus as to the course best to be pursued for making the conquest of the country this conversation was held in the presence of various nobles and officers among whom was the admiral of the fleet who had come with the various other naval commanders as was stated in the last chapter to view the battlefield demaratus said that he did not think that the king could easily get possession of the peloponnesus by marching to it directly so formidable would be the opposition that he would encounter at the isthmus there was however he said an island called cythera opposite to the territories of sparta and not far from the shore of which he thought that the king could easily get possession and which once fully in his power might be made the base of future operations for the reduction of the whole peninsula as bodies of troops could be dispatched from it to the mainland in any numbers and at any time he recommended therefore that three hundred ships with a proper complement of men should be detached from the fleet and sent round at once to take possession of that island to this plan the admiral of the fleet was totally opposed it was natural that he should be so 
since the detaching of three hundred ships for this enterprise would greatly weaken the force under his command it would leave the fleet he told the king a miserable remnant not superior to that of the enemy for they had already lost four hundred ships by storms he thought it infinitely preferable that the fleet and the army should advance together the one by sea and the other on the land and complete their conquests as they went along he advised the king too to beware of demaratus's advice he was a greek and as such his object was the admiral believed to betray and ruin the expedition after hearing these conflicting opinions the king decided to follow the admiral's advice i will adopt your counsel said he but i will not hear anything said against demaratus for i am convinced that he is a true and faithful friend to me saying this he dismissed the council. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10 of Xerxes The Burning of Athens, B.C. 480. When the officers of the Persian fleet had satisfied themselves with examining the battlefield at Thermopylae and had heard the narrations given by the soldiers, of the terrible combats that had been fought with the desperate garrison which had been stationed to defend the pass, they went back to their vessels and prepared to make sail to the southward in pursuit of the Greek fleet. The Greek fleet had gone to Salamis. The Persians in due time overtook them there, and a great naval conflict occurred which is known in history as the Battle of Salamis, and was one of the most celebrated naval battles of ancient times. An account of this battle will form the subject of the next chapter. In this, we are to follow the operations of the army on the land. As the pass of Thermopylae was now in Xerxes' possession, the way was open before him to all that portion of the great territory which lay north of the Peloponnesus. Of course, before he could enter the peninsula itself, he must pass the Isthmus of Corinth, where he might, perhaps, encounter some concentrated resistance. North of the Isthmus, however, there was no place where the Greeks could make a stand. The country was all open, or rather, there were a thousand ways open through the various valleys and glens and along the banks of the rivers. All that was necessary was to procure guides and proceed. The Thessalians were very ready to furnish guides. They had submitted to Xerxes before the Battle of Thermopylae, and they considered themselves accordingly as his allies. They had, besides, a special interest in conducting the Persian army on account of the hostile feelings which they entertained toward the people immediately south of the pass, into whose territories Xerxes would first carry his ravages. This people were the Phocaeans. Their country, as has already been stated, was separated from Thessaly by impassable mountains, except where the Straits of Thermopylae opened a passage, and through this pass both nations had been continually making hostile incursions into the territory of the other for many years before the Persian invasion. The Thessalians had surrendered readily to the summons of Xerxes, while the Phocaeans had determined to resist him and adhere to the cause of the Greeks in the struggle. They were suspected of having been influenced in a great measure in their determination to resist by the fact that the Thessalians had decided to surrender. They were resolved that they would not, on any account, be upon the same side with their ancient and inveterate foes. The hostility of the Thessalians to the Phocaeans 
was equally implacable. At the last incursion which they had made into the Phocaean territory, they had been defeated by means of stratagems in a manner which tended greatly to vex and irritate them. There were two of these stratagems which were both completely successful and both of a very extraordinary character. The first was this. The Thessalians were in the Phocaean country in great force, and the Phocaeans had found themselves utterly unable to expel them. Under these circumstances, a body of the Phocaeans, 600 in number, one day whitened their faces, their arms and hands, their clothes, and all their weapons with chalk, and then at the dead of night, perhaps, however, when the moon was shining, made an onset upon the camp of the enemy. The Thessalian sentinels were terrified and ran away, and the soldiers, awakened from their slumbers by these unearthly-looking troops, screamed with fright and fled in all directions in utter confusion and dismay. A night attack is usually a dangerous attempt, even if the assaulting party is the strongest, as in the darkness and confusion which then prevail, the assailants cannot ordinarily distinguish friends from foes, and so are in great danger amid the tumult and obscurity of slaying one another. That difficulty was obviated in this case by the strange disguise which the Phocaeans had assumed. They knew that all were Thessalians who were not whitened like themselves. The Thessalians were totally discomfited and dispersed by this encounter. The other stratagem was of a different character and was directed against a troop of cavalry. The Thessalian cavalry were renowned throughout the world. The broad plains extending through the heart of their country contained excellent fields for training and exercising such troops, and the mountains which surrounded it furnished grassy slopes and verdant valleys that supplied excellent pasturage for the rearing of horses. The nation was very strong, therefore, in this species of force, and many of the states and kingdoms of Greece, when planning their means of internal defense, and potentates and conquerors, when going forth on great campaigns, often considered their armies incomplete, unless there was included in them a corps of Thessalian cavalry. A troop of this cavalry had invaded Phocis, and the Phocaeans, conscious of their inability to resist them in open war, contrived to entrap them in the following manner. They dug a long trench in the ground, and then putting in baskets or casks sufficient nearly to fill the space, they spread over the top a thin layer of soil. They then concealed all indications that the ground had been disturbed by spreading leaves over the surface. The trap being thus prepared, they contrived to entice the Thessalians to the spot by a series of retreats, and at length led them into the pitfall thus provided for them. The substructure of casks was strong enough to sustain the Phocaeans who went over it as footmen, but was too fragile to bear the weight of the mounted troops. The horses broke through, and the squadron was thrown into such confusion by so unexpected a disaster that when the Phocaeans turned and fell upon them, they were easily overcome. These things had irritated and vexed the Thessalians very much. They were eager for revenge, and they were very ready to guide the armies of Xerxes into the country of their enemies in order to obtain it. The troops advanced accordingly, awakening everywhere as they came on the greatest consternation and terror among the inhabitants, and producing on all sides scenes of indescribable anguish and suffering. They came into the valley of the Cephasus, 
a beautiful river flowing through a delightful and fertile region which contained many cities and towns and was filled everywhere with an industrious rural population. Through this scene of peace and happiness and plenty, the vast horde of invaders swept on with the destructive force of a tornado. They plundered the towns of everything which could be carried away and destroyed what they were compelled to leave behind them. There is a catalog of 12 cities in this valley which they burned. The inhabitants, too, were treated with the utmost cruelty. Some were seized and compelled to follow the army as slaves. Others were slain, and others still were subjected to nameless cruelties and atrocities, worse sometimes than death. Many of the women, both mothers and maidens, died in consequence of the brutal violence with which the soldiers treated them. The most remarkable of the transactions connected with Xerxes' advance through the country of Phocis on his way to Athens were those connected with his attack upon Delphi. Delphi was a sacred town, the seat of the oracle. It was in the vicinity of Mount Parnassus and of the Castalian Spring, places of very great renown in the Greek mythology. Parnassus was the name of a short mountainous range rather than of a single peak, though the loftiest summit of the range was called Parnassus II. This summit is found by modern measurement to be about 8,000 feet high, and it is covered with snow nearly all the year. When bare, it consists only of a desolate range of rocks with mosses and a few alpine plants growing on the sheltered and sunny sides of them. From the top of Parnassus, travelers who now visit it look down upon almost all of Greece as upon a map. The Gulf of Corinth is a silver lake at their feet, and the plains of Thessaly are seen extending far and wide to the northward, with Olympus, Pelion, and Osa, blue and distant peaks, bounding the view. Parnassus has, in fact, a double summit, between the peaks of which a sort of ravine commences, which, as it extends down the mountain, becomes a beautiful valley, shaded with rows of trees and adorned with slopes of verdure and banks of flowers. In a glen connected with this valley, there is a fountain of water springing copiously from among the rocks in a grove of laurels. This fountain gives rise to a stream, which, after bounding over the rocks and meandering between mossy banks for a long distance down the mountain glens, becomes a quiet lowland stream and flows gently through a fertile and undulating country to the sea. This fountain was the famous Castellian Spring. It was, as the ancient Greek legends said, the favorite resort and residence of Apollo and the Muses, and its waters became, accordingly, the symbol and the emblem of poetical inspiration. The city of Delphi was built upon the lower declivities of the Parnassian ranges, and yet high above the surrounding country. It was built in the form of an amphitheater in a sort of lap in the hill where it stood, with steep precipices descending to a great depth on either side. It was thus a position of difficult access and was considered almost impregnable in respect to its military strength. Besides its natural defenses, it was considered as under the special protection of Apollo. Delphi was celebrated throughout the world in ancient times, not only for the oracle itself, but for the magnificence of the architectural structures, the boundless profusion of the works of art, and the immense value of the treasures which, in process of time, had been accumulated there. The various powers and potentates that had resorted to it to obtain the response of the oracle had brought rich presents or made costly contributions in some way to the service of the shrine. Some had built temples, 
Others had constructed porches or colonnades. Some had adorned the streets of the city with architectural embellishments. Others had caused statues to be erected, and others had made splendid donations of vessels of gold and silver, until at length the wealth and magnificence of Delphi was the wonder of the world. All nations resorted to it, some to see its splendors, and others to obtain the counsel and direction of the oracle in emergencies of difficulty or danger. In the time of Xerxes, Delphi had been for several hundred years in the enjoyment of its fame as a place of divine inspiration. It was said to have been originally discovered in the following manner. Some herdsmen on the mountains, watching their flocks, observed one day a number of goats performing very strange and unaccountable antics among some crevices in the rocks, and going to the place, they found that a mysterious wind was issuing from the crevices, which produced an extraordinary exhilaration on all who breathed it. Everything extraordinary was thought in those days to be supernatural and divine, and the fame of this discovery was spread everywhere, the people supposing that the effect produced upon the men and animals by breathing the mysterious air was a divine inspiration. A temple was built over the spot, priests and priestesses were installed, a city began to rise, and in process of time Delphi became the most celebrated oracle in the world, and as the vast treasures which had been accumulated there consisted mainly of gifts and offerings consecrated to a divine and sacred service, they were all understood to be under divine protection. They were defended, it is true, in part by the inaccessibleness of the position of Delphi and by the artificial fortifications which had been added from time to time to increase the security, but still more by the feeling which everywhere prevailed that any violence offered to such a shrine would be punished by the gods as sacrilege. The account of the manner in which Xerxes was repulsed as related by the ancient historians, is somewhat marvelous. We, however, in this case, as in all others, transmit the story to our readers as the ancient historians give it to us. The main body of the army pursued its way directly southward toward the city of Athens, which was now the great object at which Xerxes aimed. A large detachment, however, separating from the main body, moved more to the westward, toward Delphi. Their plan was to plunder the temples and the city, and send the treasures to the king. The Delphians, on hearing this, were seized with consternation. They made application themselves to the oracle to know what they were to do in respect to the sacred treasures. They could not defend them, they said, against such a host, and they inquired whether they should bury them in the earth or attempt to remove them to some distant place of safety. The oracle replied that they were to do nothing at all in respect to the sacred treasures. The divinity, it said, was able to protect what was its own. They, on their part, had only to provide for themselves, their wives, and their children. On hearing this response, the people dismissed all care in respect to the treasures of the temple and of the shrine, and made arrangements for removing their families and their own effects to some place of safety toward the southward. The military force of the city and a small number of the inhabitants alone remained. When the Persians began to draw near, a prodigy occurred in the temple, which seemed intended to warn the profane invaders away. It seems that there was a suit of arms, of a costly character doubtless, and highly decorated with gold and gems, the present probably of some Grecian state or king, 
which were hung in an inner and sacred apartment of the temple, and which it was sacrilegious for any human hand to touch. These arms were found, on the day when the Persians were approaching, removed to the outward front of the temple. The priest who first observed them was struck with amazement and awe. He spread the intelligence among the soldiers and the people that remained, and the circumstance awakened in them great animation and courage. Nor were the hopes of divine interposition, which this wonder awakened, disappointed in the end. For as soon as the detachment of Persians came near the hill on which Delphi was situated, loud thunder burst from the sky, and a bolt, descending upon the precipices near the town, detached two enormous masses of rock, which rolled down upon the ranks of the invaders. The Delphian soldiers, taking advantage of the scene of panic and confusion which this awful visitation produced, rushed down upon their enemies and completed their discomfiture. They were led on and assisted in this attack by the spirits of two ancient heroes who had been natives of the country and to whom two of the temples of Delphi had been consecrated. These spirits appeared in the form of tall and full-armed warriors who led the attack and performed prodigies of strength and valor in the onset upon the Persians, and then, when the battle was over, disappeared as mysteriously as they came. In the meantime, the great body of the army of Xerxes, with the monarch at their head, was advancing on Athens. During his advance, the city had been in a continual state of panic and confusion. In the first place, when the Greek fleet had concluded to give up the contest in the Artemisian Channel before the Battle of Thermopylae and had passed around to Salamis, the commanders in the city of Athens had given up the hope of making any effectual defense and had given orders that the inhabitants should save themselves by seeking a refuge wherever they could find it. This annunciation, of course, filled the city with dismay, and the preparations for a general flight opened everywhere scenes of terror and distress, of which those who have never witnessed the evacuation of a city by its inhabitants can scarcely conceive. The immediate object of the general terror was at this time the Persian fleet, for the Greek fleet having determined to abandon the waters on that side of Attica, left the whole coast exposed, and the Persians might be expected at any hour to make a landing within a few miles of the city. Scarcely, however, had the impending of this danger been made known to the city before the tidings of one still more imminent reached it in the news that the pass of Thermopylae had been carried, and that, in addition to the peril with which the Athenians were threatened by the fleet on the side of the sea, the whole Persian army was coming down upon them by land. This fresh alarm greatly increased, of course, the general consternation. All the roads leading from the city toward the south and west were soon covered with parties of wretched fugitives, exhibiting as they pressed forward, weary and wayworn, on their toilsome and almost hopeless flight, every possible phase of misery, destitution, and despair. The army fell back to the isthmus, intending to make a stand, if possible, there to defend the Peloponnesus. The fugitives made the best of their way to the sea coast where they were received on board transport ships sent thither from the fleet and conveyed some to Aegina, some to Salamis, and others to other points on the coasts and islands to the south, wherever the terrified exiles thought there was the best prospect of safety. Some, however, remained at Athens. There was a part of the population who believed that the phrase wooden walls used by the oracle, referred not to the ships of the fleet, 
but to the wooden palisade around the citadel. They accordingly repaired and strengthened the palisade and established themselves in the fortress with a small garrison which undertook to defend it. The citadel of Athens, or the Acropolis, as it was called, was the richest and most splendid and magnificent fortress in the world. It was built upon an oblong rocky hill, the sides of which were perpendicular cliffs, except at one end, where alone the summit was accessible. This summit presented an area of an oval form about a thousand feet in length and five hundred broad, thus containing a space of about ten acres. This area upon the summit, and also the approaches at the western end, were covered with the most grand, imposing, and costly architectural structures that then existed in the whole European world. There were temples, colonnades, gateways, stairways, porticos, towers, and walls, which, viewed as a whole, presented a most magnificent spectacle that excited universal admiration, and which, when examined in detail, awakened a greater degree of wonder still by the costliness of the materials, the beauty and perfection of the workmanship, and the richness and profusion of the decorations which were seen on every hand. The number and variety of statues of bronze and of marble which had been erected in the various temples and upon the different platforms were very great. There was one, a statue of Minerva, which was executed by Phidias, the great Athenian sculptor, after the celebrated battle of Marathon in the days of Darius, which, with its pedestal, was sixty feet high. It stood on the left of the grand entrance, towering above the buildings in full view from the country below, and leaning upon its long spear like a colossal sentinel on guard. In the distance, on the right, from the same point of view, the great temple, called the Parthenon, was to be seen, a temple which was, in some respects, the most celebrated in the world. The ruins of these edifices remain to the present day, standing in desolate and solitary grandeur on the rocky hill which they once so richly adorned. When Xerxes arrived at Athens, he found, of course, no difficulty in obtaining possession of the city itself, since it had been deserted by its inhabitants and left defenseless. The people that remained had all crowded into the citadel. They had built the wooden palisade across the only approach by which it was possible to get near the gates, and they had collected large stones on the tops of the rocks to roll down upon their assailants if they should attempt to ascend. Xerxes, after ravaging and burning the town, took up a position upon a hill opposite to the citadel, and there he had engines constructed to throw enormous arrows on which tow that had been dipped in pitch was wound. This combustible envelopment of the arrows was set on fire before the weapon was discharged, and a shower of the burning missiles thus formed was directed toward the palisade. The wooden walls were soon set on fire by them and totally consumed. The access to the Acropolis was, however, still difficult being by a steep acclivity up which it was very dangerous to ascend so long as the besiegers were ready to roll down rocks upon their assailants from above. At last, however, after a long conflict and much slaughter, Xerxes succeeded in forcing his way into the citadel. Some of his troops contrived to find a path by which they could climb up to the walls. Here, after a desperate combat with those who were stationed to guard the place, they succeeded in gaining admission, and then opened the gates to their comrades below. The Persian soldiers, exasperated with the resistance which they had encountered, slew the soldiers of the garrison, perpetrated every imaginable violence 
on the wretched inhabitants who had fled there for shelter, and then plundered the citadel and set it on fire. The heart of Xerxes was filled with exultation and joy as he thus arrived at the attainment of what had been the chief and prominent object of his campaign. To plunder and destroy the city of Athens had been the great pleasure that he had promised himself in all the mighty preparations that he had made. This result was now realized, and he dispatched a special messenger immediately to Susa with the triumphant tidings. End of chapter 10